Hello, welcome back to the Matthew Schoen Sociology Experience. Um, it is week 12. My intention this week is to cover uh, political sociology, uh, recording this episode here from the Panic Room. So let's get into the material. Um, political sociology is an interesting topic because obviously there's some very clear overlap between political sociology and political science, okay? Um, and so in, in my opinion, uh, and from my reading of the literature, it, it seems to me that uh, the big difference between these two uh, things is that uh, political science tends to focus on the operation of political systems um, and uh, what, what is happening within political systems, whereas political sociology tends to look at the determinants of certain political systems, right? What are the conditions that give rise to various types of governments and various types of political functions? What are the outcomes of having a certain type of uh, political system? So my agenda for today is to first theorize about the ideal or the average types of governments that exist throughout the world. And then I want to present a very cross-national and transnational analysis of this issue of democracy. I want to talk and, and discuss really at length uh, what are the trends that we see in uh, democratic governance throughout the world. I want to engage in the um, issue of democratic failures? What is it that causes a country to become not a country anymore? What is it that causes a democracy to become not a democracy anymore? So we're going to see there are very predictable situations in which a democracy will deteriorate and ultimately fail, okay? Um, and, and those situations are not inevitable. They're often the result of population, demography, um, economics, and, and, and the priorities of a population. Okay, so in the way of uh, announcements, we're continuing to get our work done. We're continuing to get our stuff in and, and make progress. Uh, group B, you are writing a reaction paper for me this week, and that is uh, about political sociology. I want you to pay very close attention to the article, How Social Movements Matter. That's going to be the topic of the video for Wednesday. Uh, that's written by David Meyer. And I want you to listen to uh, a This American Life podcast uh, called Take the Money and Run for Office. It is about this very complicated relationship between money and the political system. Is it really as simple as donate money to your congressperson and get the legislation that you want? No, probably not. So uh, that's a complicated relationship. Uh, the role of lobbyists, the role of something like Citizens United, that's all uh, wh uh, what we're going into. But before we talk about the role of money in democracies, I first want to talk about what a democracy actually is and how it operates and under what conditions it will succeed or fail. For those of you that have to write for me this week, you will upload that assignment on Friday, April 3rd, no later than 9.15 a.m. Uh, please let me know if that will be a problem for you, okay? So let's talk about government. There are throughout the world four, but really five, but but really four systems of government. Now I've used this term uh, several times over the ideal type, this idea of, well, we, we know that even within a democracy, there's going to be very various types of democracies, right? You can have like a more conservative uh, style democracy, similar to the United Kingdom or the United States. You can have a very liberal democracy like Norway, Sweden, and Finland. You can have a real pluralistic democracy like Switzerland, um, which is a very interesting country. If you look at the Swiss voting patterns, um, very few, they have very low voting turnout for national office for things like the prime minister. Um, and, and that's because so much of the Swiss uh, decision making is actually done at the local level. So they actually have, um, they, they have what's known as direct democracy and are one of the only countries in the world that has something called direct democracy. Um, most democracies operate under a representative system where we uh, elect the people uh, who then represent us and make decisions on our behalf, or perhaps I should say we elect the people who then make decisions on corporations behalf, but I digress a little bit there. Um, in Switzerland, you can vote yourself almost anything, right? A lot of it goes up to national referendums. So you can vote yourself a free six pack a week if, if, if that's what the population wanted. Um, and, and most countries don't have a similar type of system, even though referendums do happen um, at the local level. It's often about like school funding or like bridge taxes and things like that. So anyway, let's go through the four slash five systems of government. 
The first is what's known as a monarchy. And here, like, I mean a literal monarchy. I don't mean a symbolic monarchy like what you will observe in the United Kingdom or Belgium or Spain. There, the classic heads of state are the monarchs, but the monarchs hold very little real power very little political power. In the UK, the Queen, Queen Victoria just, or Queen Elizabeth, pardon me, um, she holds symbolic power, and that's really it. Most of the world's monarchies are concentrated in places like the Middle East. These are very common in Middle Eastern petro states, um, and they're um, somewhat common in um, Southeast Asia, right? So Cambodia, for example, has a monarch and, and so on and so forth. Um, so Saudi Arabia is perhaps the most powerful example of a country uh, run by a, mo a monarch, by, by a royal family. Um, Kuwait, Oman, very oil-rich countries tend to have this type of a government, uh, but not all, because Nigeria doesn't have this, Russia doesn't have this, Venezuela doesn't have this. Second would be what's known as an authoritarian state. So these are states where there's single party control. You might have elections at the local level, but not at the national level. An authoritarian regime is one in which there is some type of freedom among the population, but there isn't often freedom to choose the country's representatives or to choose the country's political policy path. Best example of that throughout the world is clearly China, but Russia would certainly count as well. Iran is another good example. Or Iran, people vote for a president. They, they vote for the prime minister or uh, president of Iran, um, but that guy has relatively little power compared to uh, the supreme leader, the Ayatollah, who, who generally makes all the decisions um, for where the country is going long term. Um, and then Belarus, um, right, Europe's last autocracy is, is a really good example of this. Um, you have very extreme examples of authoritarian states called totalitarian states. These are states where all behavior and actions of the population is controlled uh, by the, the central regime. Easily the best example of what this looks like in practice is a country like North Korea, although Myanmar is, is quickly becoming another uh, example. You compare North Korea to China, and that's a very easy way to see the difference between a totalitarian state um, and, a, uh, and a, an authoritarian state. Um, in an authoritarian state, uh, all sorts of things are controlled and there's very little direct voting, but you know what you can do in China that you can't do in North Korea? Leave the country. So that's, to me, a pretty good way to, to conceptualize and to think about the differences between the two, uh, the two types. And then the fourth is the one that most of us in the room, I suspect, are familiar with. Uh, most of us are, 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 this might be the only, uh, probably is the only type of uh, government that, that any of us have lived under, democracy. And that can take the form, as I said, of liberal or direct or pluralistic or conservative. Either way, think about the United States, think about the Japanese, think about the Germans. These are the countries that generally operate through the election of representatives who then we hope enact the will of the population at a policy level. Now, as you can see, I'm trying to get cheeky a little bit with there's four systems of governments, but really five. The fifth system of government is actually no government at all. And that's what's known as a failed state. Uh, a failed state is a political sociology and political science term that refers to a government or a country that has lost the ability to provide even the most basic social uh, services um, for its population. So if you think about a country like Afghanistan, for example, which right now has a very tenuous central government, um, but the government there is by no means in uh, charge of the vast majority of the uh, country's population. Um, and, and, that's, and that's really important to keep in mind. When you think about a state failing, it's the collapse of central institutions. It's the collapse of a central authority um, structure. And you can also kind of split the difference between a failed state and an authoritarian state by looking at a place like Pakistan, for example. Pakistan is not in control of at least a third of her territory, um, but you still do have centralized institutions that try to function the best they can. Good examples of failed states throughout the world, Somalia, which has not had a functioning government in 25 years, Sudan and South Sudan, um, which are, uh, South Sudan is the world's youngest country. It was created in 2011, um, and, and, and the people of Sudan and South Sudan have been subject to absolutely horrific levels of violence, civil war, and ethnic cleansing um, throughout the, the country's territory for the last several decades. Syria has completely imploded. Bashar al-Assad says he's in charge of Syria, um, 
but for many years that was uh that was that was a very optimistic reading of the situation although with the help of russia turkey and iran he does appear to have beaten back these rebels um at the risk of completely de i mean at, at the cost of completely destroying the country um iraq is a good example the democratic republic of the congo the central african republic yemen home to the world's most obscene humanitarian crisis. Um, so failed states, if you have no government, that does affect the way that you live. If you have no central institutions, that does affect the way that you live. And that's why many of us consider a failed state to be a theoretically important type of political system, okay? All right, so I'm gonna move on now to talk about democracy because we in the United States are very connected to the ideas of democracy and freedom. It's not hard to see why. Throughout the world, countries in a democratic system generally operate under better uh, outcomes. They generally produce more freedom, more health, a better health, I should say, better levels of education. However, there's increasing belief, and I, I actually am one of the people that believes this, uh, increasing belief uh, along the idea that having a democracy is more the result of a healthy society than it is the cause of a healthy society. And as I go through the things that a democracy needs to sustain itself, I hope that that will ultimately become clear. Political scientists talk about a period called the democratic wave. And that is re in reference to the period of, uh, since 1974, since this decolonization period of the 1970s, over, uh, not over, 99 countries have transitioned from non-democratic systems of government, be that colonial or authoritarian or whatever, and have transitioned to democracy. So that includes multiple countries in Eastern Europe, the former Soviet bloc, that includes uh, Russia, ostensibly, that includes uh, um, large parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so we've seen, this is what, what political scientists call the tidal wave of democracy. Democracy went from being a minor piece of the world's political, uh, the world's political uh, uh, diversity to being the primary way in which we governed ourselves. That included 68% of all authoritarian states at the time transitioned to democracy, so almost three-fourths. That included 78% of post-colonial states, so that included Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and um, large parts of the Pacific Islands and 60% of former Soviet Union states. So that involved, that's places like Poland, uh, the Czech Republic, um, Slovakia, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and uh, Estonia and the Baltic regions, but it does not include places like Ukraine, does not include places like Belarus, um, and, and certainly doesn't include Central Asian republics like um, Kazakhstan and Tajikistan. Anyway, uh, also since 1974, 22% of all those democracies that did transition ultimately collapse. So while it's a real wave to say that 99, almost 100 countries have transitioned to democracy, I seriously wonder about that success rate. 22%, this is one of those areas where the percentage and the fractions frame the problem a little differently. If I think 22%, that doesn't seem like a lot to me. But when I figure out that that is almost 25%, that's very close to one out of every four, which seems pretty common to me, actually. That, so this is by no means unheard of for a democracy to fail. Um, and it tells us something about the maintenance of a democracy. The second a country has its first democratic election, that is not enough, right? That's not the point where you throw up your hands and say, great, we're a democracy now and we have no more work to do. No, no, no. Having a democracy is like having a child. When you have a child, it's not like you just give birth to that kid and that's it, your job is done. No, you have to raise and nurture and socialize that child and take care of that child for 18 years, 25 if you believe most recent uh, uh, census data about when people finally move out from living with their parents. Um, and so that tells me that Having a democracy is hard. Having a democracy, it's one thing to say you're a democracy. It's much harder to actually maintain that because there are many countries that claim to be democratic but are democratic in name only. This is becoming especially common in Central Asia, the Central Asian republics who all claim to have uh, democratic systems. But if you look at the sheer amount of electoral corruption and um restrictions on campaigning for opposition groups, it becomes clear that anybody trying to challenge the central regime really doesn't stand a chance at all. Um, 
And in fact, there's a slightly amusing slash terrifying story um, from, I want to say Tajikistan, but it could be Kyrgyzstan, um, one of the stands in that part of the world, um, where uh, the government was supposed to hold, was scheduled to hold an election on a Tuesday, and the government accidentally released the results of the election on Monday. <laughs> Does not take a PhD in political science uh, to figure out what happened there. So with even if you have, you could, it's one thing to say we have elections, it's a much different thing to, to actually have fair, open, and clean elections. So since 1974, 22% of all democracies have collapsed, and we have seen no significant increases in the proportion of the world's uh, governments being democratic since the year 2000. So now that's a 20-year stagnation of democratic development um, that, that's just been stalled. It's a completely lost generation uh, of countries uh, transitioning to democracy. So what I want to do now is present to you the, the necessary things. There are several things that political uh, sociologists point out as saying these aren't things that necessarily guarantee a stable, safe democracy, but these are things that um, are known to protect the existence of a democracy. These are so, think of these as social conditions that encourage democratic development and democratic stability. And I'm gonna start with the first thing that we care, that everybody cares the most about, money. Democracy is something known to require a certain level of wealth. It's not that it requires wealth to buy democracy, but what it does is wealth buys stability among the people. There's a couple things that are going on here. Um, for starters, wealthy people generally, that, that social wealth generally correlates with higher levels of education. And educated people demand more accountability. They demand more from their central government. And they're also able to think long term. This happens in the United States all the time, by the way, a country with, with a democracy, with a, a long-running democracy, um, where you see that it's, it's people with money, it's middle class and above that are the ones that generally look forward towards the future. They're generally the groups of people that, that can plan for the future. And it's not hard to see why. If you are poor, your focus is on getting through the day. Your focus is on getting food on the table and, and surviving this day. And it's very difficult to think long term about where my political system is going. It's only the middle class, the upper class and the intelligentsia that has the privilege of actually thinking long term like that. Um, so uh, educated people demand more accountability. And when you think about a democracy collapsing, the more wealth people have, the more money that they have, um, having a democratic collapse is chaotic, right? It's not a good situation. Stuff is lost. There's looting, malicious form. Um, when people have something to protect, they have a vested interest in pursuing political things, in pursu pursuing political outcomes through a democratic process, uh, because revolution is pretty darn scary. Right. It, it just is like and, and I will say that if you look at countries like Egypt or countries like Syria, um, countries that have had uh, recent revolutions in between the old guys being in charge and the new guys being in charge, there is always a period in which nobody is in charge. And if that sounds awesome to you in like some kind of libertarian fantasy you might have, it, it's only because you've never experienced before it, it before the process is chaotic and terrifying and ugly and violent and so the more people have to protect the le the more people have to lose the less willing they are to pursue extremely chaotic means of governmental uh, transition or governmental capture and so that's in fact what you're seeing on this graph here. If I look at my x-axis, it's uh, GDP per capita. Um, and you can see that on the left, it's the World Polity 4, which is a data set that measures democracy scores throughout the world, um, measured uh, either uh, negative or positive numbers. So the lower a dot, each dot here would be a country. So the lower down here, you're talking about very poor and very non-democratic countries. And way out here, uh, we have very rich and very democratic countries. And we can see there's a pretty big upswing. Once you reach a certain point, democracies tend to just form and, and, and maintain themselves. And political science, uh, uh, sociologists call this the price of democracy because no democracy with GDP per capita above $9,000 has ever collapsed, ever. Um, 
And that's not because like, that's not a threshold to say like, oh, well, if we just distribute everybody a universal basic income of $9,000 every year, then we'll have a democracy. No, not quite. But it shows you that that correlates with social progress in other areas. Those people have more to lose, more to protect, and they're demanding a lot more accountability from the people that govern them. A couple outliers here. China is in Belarus are two of the wealthier non-democracies. Singapore is one of the very wealthy non-democracies. Um, Singapore is pretty authoritarian, um, but they're so goddamn rich that the people generally accept that. The point overarching here is clear, though, is that there's a positive correlation that the wealthier a country becomes, the more democratic it, 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 it becomes. But as I have constantly demonstrated, it's not just how much money people have or how much wealth exists within a society or a nation. It's also about how that's distributed. So let's go back to our good friend, the Gini coefficient, which measures inequality. The larger the score on the Gini coefficient, the uh, more economic inequality you will observe in that area. Inequality, income inequality very much correlates with poverty. If not at the social level, it, like, it doesn't mean everybody's in poor because uh, everybody's uh, impoverished. But think about what inequality means. These people are doing really well and these people are doing very, very poorly. That has a big, big difference between those two groups of people. You throw inequality into it and it shows to that poor impoverished group, your life could be a lot better, but it's not. Why? Why isn't it? Well, look at those other people right there. See, it really severs the democratic nature. Like it, it severs the connections that we need to do things in a democratic way for a couple reasons. If you are doing very, very well, if you are very wealthy in a high inequality society, do you necessarily want democracy? No, you're doing well, perhaps under an authoritarian system. Why would you want to go upset the apple cart? And if you're very, very poor, why would you want to necessarily, in, in a high inequality society, why would you necessarily want to pursue that democratically either? It's not like the wealthy are playing by the rules. So the whole thing discourages democratic cooperation. And it also means the rich and the poor in a lot of places are living fundamentally different lives. And as a result, they have trouble understanding each other. And as a result, they have trouble working together. The ability to cooperate and to pursue things democratically is just not there. So that's ultimately what you're seeing on this graph here. You are seeing a, um, a negative correlation. As the Gini coefficient increases, you see that on the x-axis here, the Freedom House Democracy Index declines. So the most economically unequal places also tend to have the lowest levels of democracy. Um, it's just very hard to cooperate in conditions of extreme economic inequality. Okay, so wealth protects democracy and equality of outcomes tends to protect democratic process, uh, progress. Let's go back to where that money and income inequality is actually coming from, though, because one of the semi-ironic findings that we see throughout the world is that the countries that are blessed with the greatest amount of natural resources tend to be the poorest. They tend to have the highest rates of economic inequality, and they tend to have the lowest rates of democracy. This is what's known as the resource curse. So what you're seeing on the x-axis here, natural resource dependence. Countries at the far right side of this are have a very high proportion of their national GDP is tied up in natural resource extraction. Think oil, in the case of say Saudi Arabia, not a democracy. Think natural gas in the case of Russia or Uzbekistan, again, not democracies and think uh, minerals in the case of, say, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, again, not coincidentally, not a democracy. The resource curse theorizes that when so much money is being captured through natural resource uh, sales, the sale of oil, gas, and minerals, and there is relatively little ability to make money anywhere else in that society, 
that creates a powerful anti-democratic group because the group of people that ultimately are making the most money off of oil contracts or mineral contracts, do you think they really want to share the wealth and the gains of what they own? It it, it, it kind of perfectly explains places like Saudi Arabia and places like the Congo, where there's a very wealthy national elite that's profiting, or in Angola, in the case of Angola, with oil, Nigeria, in the case of uh, the, the oil uh, reserves there. Um, Nigeria has either, at any given point in time, a very unpopular and weak democracy or a very unpopular and strong military government. And it flux, it has over many decades fluctuated back and forth there. But to say that Nigeria is a poor country is not accurate. Nigeria is one of the most naturally wealthy countries on earth. It's just that the wealth that's generated by her oil, by her minerals, are not shared throughout the rest of the population. They don't go to fund social programs. Compare that to a place like Norway, which has broken the resource curse. Norway has tremendous oil reserves and gas reserves in the North Sea. But they took all that money that they get from selling it and they funded some of the best schools in the country. They funded the best health care in the country. You know, They spent it on the creation of a very well-funded and well-functioning society. But in countries that lack that democratic experience, like uh, South Africa, for example, or um, uh, the Congo, Russia has fallen, fallen, uh, prone, uh, fall, uh, fallen prone to this, there's a real incentive for oligarchs to take and capture the wealth, and they create what's known as very exclusive political institutions. So there tends to be a real connection, a real correlation between economic inequality and poor democratic outcomes, non-democracy, um, because the people with economic power tend to use that to capture political power, okay? That creates a vicious cycle between the economic institutions. Why is the political institution rewarding the wealthy? Well, because it's run by the economic elite. Why are the economic elite doing so well? Well, they've constructed political institutions that preserve their privilege. So you can see on the graph here, as a country gets more dependent on natural resources, its income growth goes down because it's not being spent or spread around throughout the rest of the population. You look at Nigeria, which is just literally floating on oil. It's one of the real tragedies of, of international development. The average Nigerian today, the average Nigerian today, lives as if the country never had oil in the first place. Um, and that just goes to show you how it isn't being spread or, or, or shared around uh, anywhere close to uh, an equitable way, um, which is what Norway did, which is what Venezuela tried to do, and then the oil, but they were still way too dependent upon natural resource uh, sales. So when the price of oil plummeted, um, Venezuela just blew up kind of as a result of that. They had nothing to fall back on. So that's the resource curse. I now want to turn my attention to talking about state coherence. This is kind of a measure of how effective, how strong, and how respected are public institutions. So this is one of the things that we see all over the Middle East. Part of the reason why Middle Eastern countries simply are not... Um, are usually either non-democratic or, or just unable to form democracies in the natural experiments of Iraq and Afghanistan. Think about what we need public institutions to do. They need to protect basic citizen rights, right? The government needs to enforce and protect our ability to vote. The government needs to create and maintain a basic rule of law that governs all sorts of exchange and personal relationships. And it needs to meet basic demands of things that you and I simply cannot provide by ourselves. If you don't have these things, it leads to a deterioration of democracy because without a stable state to offer these things, something rises up to fill that void. In the case of Russia, right, it's been a very, like, because democratic institutions proved to be almost worthless, it kind of got 
the state became run when it, as type of gangster capitalism where oligarchs really uh, controlled the whole political system and Putin has allowed them to enrich themselves and they've allowed Putin to stay in power and the system kind of works. Um, so democracy is, is, is very rare if you don't have a strong state, if you don't have a strongly functioning central government that will lead to decentralization of all sorts of things. So instead of public school, like all education and economic transaction, all that stuff gets kind of governed then at the local level. While Switzerland has been able to do this very well, most states that have tried this, countries that have tried this, end up pretty spectacularly failing. So what you're seeing on this map here, it's uh, kind of a, a segue from state coherence into a, a different idea of fractionalization. In the absence of a strong political identity, people will retreat to typically the one and the only thing that they know better than anything else. And that is identity-based uh, or identities, which create identity-based divisions. So if we don't have a strong state, right, the United States has a, a pretty strong and coherent uh, central government. So even though there's a lot of internal diversity here in the United States, um, but people are generally able, generally able to agree upon an overarching identity of American, regardless of other sub, say, religious or ethnic identities. In many countries, though, these identity-based divisions, which we're going to define as, as ethnic or religious fractionalization, especially when you are, combine this with very weak institutions, it tends to encourage challengers to democratic system. So what you're seeing on this map here, countries shaded in the darkest have the highest level of ethnic or religious fractionalization. So... I see very strong, very high levels of fractionalization in Africa, very high levels in the Middle East, and very high levels in Canada and Spain. So all these things should go to show you that even in the case, like in the case of Canada, it's one of the healthiest democracies in the world, they're just fractionalized because of Quebec, because of the French-Canadian province where they speak a different language. And even though that's led to some weird types of separatism and, and a little bit of violence in the 80s and early 90s, um, Canada very much incorporates this minority French group into the overarching identity of Canadian. And, and that tends to fix the problem. But in the case of Africa, a lot of this, I need you to bring this back to the colonial era. One thing you need to understand is that the borders in Africa make absolutely no sense. They do not reflect the way Africans see themselves. They do not reflect the way that Africans would like to be governed in many cases. And if Africa had developed in the absence of a colonial presence, it would look a lot more like Europe today, like a bunch of small ethnic states that, that are taking up uh, space kind of right next to each other. But that never got to happen because the political lines on the map were drawn for the ease of governance or for natural resource capture. And then when the country gets independence, that border never reflected a coherent group of people to begin with. And that's how you end up with countries like Nigeria, which is bitterly split between a Muslim and a uh, Christian uh, part of the country or a country like um What's another good example? A uh, country like, uh, like Iraq. Um, Iraq's borders and Pakistan's borders and Afghanistan's borders do not reflect the tribal arrangements that have created the rivalries in that region for centuries. Like, forget about decades. This stuff goes way beyond the 20th century. And so I always have to be um, a little bit careful here. I'm not arguing that diversity destroys democracy. I'm not arguing that you have to have a mono-ethnic state. What I'm saying is diversity needs a, a very strong central government to protect the rights of minorities, to protect coalitions and cooperation. And if these groups of people don't see themselves as being part of the same country, that's how you end up with Iraq, a country that's almost impossible to govern democratically. And that makes me very sad to admit that, but it's sadly, but it is my reading of what has happened there since the invasion in 2003. So yeah, so ethnic fractionalization, when you have very weak institutions, tends to create non-democratic arrangements. And also because, with a few exceptions, 
the majority ethnic group often ends up dominating institutions in very diverse countries. Um, you can see that all over the Middle East. You can see that also here in the United States as well, although it's this is not a, this is a democratic country. You can still see the effect of racial and ethnic disadvantage, how that ripples throughout institutions um, to create generational levels of um, of discrimination and inequality. Um, one example, if you're curious of an example where the country until very recently was ruled by a minority group that oppressed the majority group, look no further than Syria, where the ruling Alawite sect, all institutional power positions were held by a religious minority in Syria that accounted for only 8% of the population. Um, Perhaps not coincidentally, the country exploded in a in a horrific civil war. To me, I don't personally think that's a coincidence. I think that's decades of uh, minority oppression upon a majority group that was able to to rise up and, and to ultimately not succeed in capturing the country. But you know what? I'm gonna stop talking about Syria because it's just gonna depress me um, if I continue on that. So anyway, so we see very uh, a strong identity-based divisions in Africa and the Middle East. And it is because, directly because, colonial borders never reflected the existing cultural and ethnic arrangements there or religious arrangements there in the first place, okay? So now I'm gonna get to what I think is personally my favorite theory. This might be my favorite sociological theory about anything, and that's the youth bulge. I'm a big believer in the power of demography. Demography is births, deaths, migration. It's the most powerful and yet most poorly understood social force. A youth bulge occurs in a situation where we have an especially large cohort of young men, say between the ages of 15 to 30, who lack regular job opportunities, maybe they're overeducated. This is a group of people that tends to uh, respond very poorly to external stress. So if you think about the ages for 15 to 30, those are stressful times. That's a time when you are thinking about trying to get assets in your life. I need an education. I need a job. I need um, somebody to get married to, right? I'd like to start a family. I'd like to do these things in my life. A youth bulge develops usually when there is a very high birth rate and a declining death rate. That creates a boom generation that throws a whole bunch of extra men Usually, and I say men because they're the ones that are most likely to be violent, unfortunately. Um, and, and so that uh, tends to be something um, that, that throws a bunch of young people into a society that can't provide places in school for them, can't provide job and uh, economic opportunities for them. So you end up with a lot of young men sitting around with not much to do. And that tends to lead to all sorts of problems. The youth bulge correlates with violence. It correlates with um, mass unemployment, it correlates with uh, terrorism, it correlates with revolution in many cases. And if you're wondering whether Syria had a very uh, dramatic youth bulge, the answer is yes, they did, right? So if you're looking here at the global median age, I want you to look for uh, countries here uh, with uh, either, either in this kind of white or this pink, uh, the tan or the pink um, colors. Um, those are places where the glow, the median age uh, in that country is either is between 14 to 25. A median is a midpoint of a distribution. So if I tell you that the median age is 17 and a half, which it is in Palestine, or 17.9, which it is in Nigeria, that means that half of everybody in Nigeria is under the age of 18. Where are those people supposed to go? What are those people supposed to do? Like, where are those people supposed to find the opportunities that might be available to them? Um, it, it tends to lead to a and it tends to lead to uh, to to problems managing a group of people who are often at that age not super connected to their institutions, not super embedded into their social institutions. Um, ultimately, in the first place, so we see very evident youth bulges in Africa and the Middle East. And if you're wondering where a youth bulge really comes from. I'm doing some research on this, and I have assisted back when I was in grad school. I, I, I assisted on, on a series of projects, mostly just doing data cleaning, um, on, on trying to understand state failure, uh, how a country becomes uh, not a country anymore. Um, and one of the things uh, that we found as a very 
very strong predictor of state failure was pre-existing gender inequality because in situations where women lack equal treatment, that means much fewer women, uh, that means a lot more girls, and I do mean young girls, not being educated. They then grow up to be women with no labor market opportunities, and they end up getting married at a very young age in order to kind of secure their, their, their place in life. The earlier you get married, the earlier you start having children. The earlier you start having children, the more of them you're ultimately going to have. The more of them you're ultimately going to have, that creates a youth bulge generation that cannot be integrated successfully into what is already a, a fairly weak society. So connect the dots. Something like gender inequality, like, you know, it's, it's got a moral consequence. It's also got a very structural consequence in um, whether the country is likely to be stable or not. All right. And then I just want to talk very briefly about uh, whether or not people have an experience with pluralism. In the United States, anybody who's like the, most of us in this class, the vast majority of those of us in this class, we've only ever lived our lives in a democratic system. So if you ask North Americans, is democracy always preferable? You get very high levels of agreement, although that is starting to decrease uh, somewhat alarmingly. If we look at other parts of the world, only 62% say this in Africa, only 60% in East Asia, only 64% in Southeast Asia, only 53% in Latin America, and only 53% in Eastern Europe. And so this leads me to perhaps my most obvious point is if I look at the, the operations of democracy, what you call democracy in uh Russia is really state capture and gangster capitalism. If I look at democracy in Latin America, it is outrageous levels of economic inequality. If I look at democracy in East Asia, it is um, the success of China, right? Or, the, or if I look at uh, East Asia, um, you know, it, the, it, people can look at how China has been a relatively successful authoritarian country, not successful if you're one of the over a million Muslims that they currently have in uh, internment camps, but whatever. Um, many parts of the world, democracy has not really brought benefits for many of the other reasons that we've already uh, discussed. So it's easy for us to sit in like a Western European or North American uh, standpoint and say, go democratic. It's the way to go. Um, if you live in Iraq, it's meant nothing but bloodshed. If you live in um, Nigeria, for example, it's meant nothing but corruption uh, generally. And so people need to see a benefit from democracy. They need to see a benefit from it uh, happening within their society. Otherwise, there isn't going to be support for it. And if there's no support for it, that's where authoritarian movements tend to come from, who often are brutal, but can solve problems in a little bit quicker of a way than a more just democratic society would be. So anyway, here's my wrap up here. If I want to turn my attention, all these things we just learned about the rest of the world to the United States, let's go through the things that are known to encourage democracy and think about what the U.S. has and what the U.S. doesn't have. Well, we definitely have the level of wealth. We definitely have a coherent state. We definitely have experience with pluralism. We don't have a, an unstable age sex uh, structure. We, have a, a, we don't have anything approximating a youth bulge. And we have relative gender equality. I mean, certainly there's, there's troubling gender inequality in the United States. But if you compare that to many other countries throughout the world, we're doing far better. If you compare uh, what the U.S. to the rest of the world and what we're not doing well on, well, among industrialized democracies, we have a very high level of income inequality. And we do have a high level of identity-based divisions. That being said, I am choosing to trust my institutions. There's been a lot of talk in the last few years about whether American democracy is in trouble. I guess maybe this is just what I want to believe, but, but what I do believe is that I just look at the checklist, I look at the data, and I think we have institutions that will survive non-democratic challenges to them. And we have a history in this United, in the United States of social movements to create more just and more democratic systems. And it is that issue about uh, social movements 
that's where I want to pick up with uh, the next time that we meet. And that stuff, for those of you that are writing, that stuff will be especially uh, helpful and important um, to doing well on that assignment. So anyway, have a good couple days. I'll catch you again on Wednesday. Thank you very much for listening. Take care.